Hey, YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Got a great episode with return realignment guest Michael Lind to talk about his new book, Hell to Pay, How the Suppression of Wages is Destroying America. And Michael's telling, really building on his last book, which also had some good episodes on, called The New Class War, the issue of low wages, bad jobs, and near non-existent uh, benefits is at the center of American politics right now. If you look at issues he highlights from a demographic crisis, declining birth rates, a social crisis, really the increasing rates of loneliness and disconnection in American society, the identity crisis, which is basically the weaponization of race and gender in our country, and then finally a political crisis, which is basically culture wars and moral panics from the left and right. He thinks that all of these are driven by one foundational issue, which is once again, this issue of bad jobs and low wages in the United States. So to really understand how these all fit together and get a really interesting new perspective on the American political scene, any conversation with Michael Lind as we wrap your alley. And I hope you all enjoy this one. Michael Lind, welcome back to The Realignment. Glad to be back. Yeah, I'm really excited to speak with you. I last had you on uh, back in person in Washington, D.C., right before COVID to talk about your previous book, The New Class War. Your new book is called How to Pay. I would love for you to start off by maybe articulating why this book is the right follow-up to the framework you offered in The New Class War. A lot of our listeners will listen to that episode first. So if they're picking up from there, why is this the logical next step in now analyzing these spaces? Well, in the new class war, I drew on the thinking of uh, James Burnham about the managerial elite and uh, other thinkers, including John Kenneth Galbraith, to argue that uh, in the 20th century, we transitioned from a bourgeois owner operator capitalist economy to one in which you have enormous bureaucracies, public, private, and nonprofit, which uh, dominate the economy and society in the culture and access to these is through uh, the college diplomas. Uh, so you get uh, the college educated, what I've called in the new class war and in my earlier book, The Next American Nation, the overclass. Some people call it PMC, professional managerial class, but I avoid that because it has a specific Marxist usage. It assumes that the PMC is a form of worker and that the capitalists are still running everything, individual capitalists. I, I don't agree with that. I think that bureaucracies run things and uh, individual capitalists have influence, obviously. But if uh, Elon Musk and, and uh, uh, all of the other billionaires vanish tomorrow, society would pretty much keep on going. But if all of the bureaucracies, all of the NGOs, you know, the corporate executives, and government civil servants managed, you know, then society would collapse. So the, the emphasis in the new class war was on credentialism as a divide between the empowered overclass elite minority, which is, you know, between 30% of the population or a little bit more, if you look at college graduates. But in practice, since as I argue in Hell to Bay, a lot of college degrees are increasingly worthless. It's really a smaller group, 10, 15% uh, of mostly people graduate professional degrees. So this is a logical follow-up to that, explaining why the working class is so weak uh, in its dealings with the, the college-educated overclass compared to where it was 50 years ago. Uh, and the argument is that it's worker power, it's the bargaining power of workers uh, both individually and collectively, to bargain for higher wages and better benefits and better treatment has been more or less systematically destroyed over the last half century by uh, business lobbies and by government, including both Democrats and Republicans. Here's what I'd love to know. I'd love for you to make this idea of worker power, of bargaining power, more, less, a little less abstract. 
So I think of, I'm obviously the definition of a white collar worker when it comes to podcasting, but I think of, um, I negotiate about my salary. I negotiate about how much of this podcast is going to be um, compensated or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's very literal in my everyday experience. When it's coming, when it comes to the experience of a blue collar working class person, how does this work area power slash bargaining dynamic manifest itself today in the workplace? Well, there's a myth that small businesses create most jobs in the economy. They create most jobs. They also destroy most jobs because most small businesses go out of business within a couple of years. Uh, Net job growth uh, is largely dominated by small firms that turn into gigantic firms. And uh, so medium-sized growing firms create most of the jobs. Not only that, but more than half of all American workers in the private sector, work for companies with more than 500 workers, okay? So uh, people of the professional class like you and me, we are not typical uh, of the average high school educated wage earner working for some national or multinational corporation that has 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 employees here and around the world. Uh, And so the bargaining power that Uh, professionals might have with small firms or with nonprofits or government agencies. Uh, If you're a janitor and you want a job with Microsoft or IBM, you know, to say as libertarians do that this is a negotiation uh, uh, where both sides, you know, are are benefiting, uh, that's absurd. You know, the janitor has zero bargaining with uh, IBM or Microsoft. It's a take it or leave it thing. In the absence of what John Kenneth Galbraith, the uh, uh, economist in the mid 20th century called countervailing power, uh, which can take two forms. Uh, One form is simply government fiat, right? You simply say the minimum wage is gonna be $15 an hour. Bernie Sanders now wants it to be 17, but it's just, it's government command to employers. The other method, which has collapsed in the private sector, not in the public sector, but in the private sector, uh, union membership has collapsed from about a third in the middle of the 20th century to 6% and falling down. It's actually lower than it was uh, under Herbert Hoover before the New Deal. Uh, but, But what collective bargaining gives you is the ability of all of the janitors to pool their labor power uh, to form a united front and to have some bargaining power, which it still may not equal the, the power of the corporation, but, but it, they, they have more power collectively than they do as individuals. I'd like to understand where the history you just told us leaves this debate, especially when it comes to ideology. Because once again, this podcast is called The Realignment. And one of the realignments of our politics that we're looking at right now is the fact that the Republican Party um, is doing better and better with working class voters. Um, I'm curious how then you see right and left responding to this dynamic because the left would say, well, Michael, that's why we support those minimum wage increases. Uh, and that's something that moved from the fringe of the Democratic Party pretty much to the center in a pretty quick space. Um, on the right, though, I would say the right doesn't seem as much interested in this worker power dynamic. How would you tell the story of how left and right have engaged with the story you're telling in the past few years? Well, basically uh, the consensus, it's sometimes called neoliberalism, the the neoliberal consensus since the 1990s has been shared by the center right and the center left. Uh, And the consensus is what I describe in Hell to Pay as the low wage, high welfare system. And by high welfare, I don't mean it's terribly generous welfare. I mean that welfare is high as a percentage of a low income worker's overall income. So it is taken for granted that we will have millions and millions of American workers in retail, in janitorial services, in nursing aides, and so on, who are paid wages that are not only inadequate for them to Uh, support a family and children, but they can't even support themselves on what they are paid. 
And both the mainstream Republicans and mainstream Democrats now for a generation have said, well, that's okay. Uh, the government will top up their income and it will top up their inadequate poverty wage income through a variety of programs. And the, the center right tends to prefer the earned income tax credit, which is a, a wage subsidy for working people who make too little to live on. Uh, the center left you know, tends to favor socialist in-kind benefits, public housing, food stamps, things like that. But they both agree that it would be unreasonable to expect employers to pay workers enough to support themselves, much less you know, a, a, you know, children or a caregiving spouse. Uh, and as I point out in Hill debate, this is one of two ways that you can organize a modern industrial society in which most people are wage earners. They sell their labor in return for wages that they use to purchase the necessities of life. The other method uh, is a living wage system in which the uh, costs of paying a living wage, or if you're more ambitious, a family wage, are passed on to uh, consumers. So these two different systems, you know, the living wage system uh, coupled with social insurance, which is a form of basically, you know, forced personal insurance, and the low wage high welfare system that we now have, uh, they have different beneficiaries. The beneficiaries of our present low wage high welfare system are low wage employers and consumers, right? Your goods are cheaper. Your restaurant meal is cheaper because the workers are paid poverty wages. Uh, if the workers were paid a higher wage, either the restaurant would automate to save on labor costs uh, or uh, it would, it would pass on the higher price for your breakfast tacos or whatever. Uh, you know, the, the losers in the high wage, I'm, I'm sorry, the low wage high welfare system are the taxpayers because the system that we've had with the support of neoliberal Democrats and uh, center right Republicans is a system in which the benefits of low wages go to employers and consumers of the products made by these poverty wage workers. The costs are passed on to you and me, to the taxpayers. So you and I may not you know, use any goods or buy any products uh, from workers who are paid poverty wages, but nevertheless, we are taxed, you and I, to pay the EITC. So we're basically subsidizing the consumption of other people uh, and we're subsidizing the profits of employers who, who pay their workers too little to live on. Uh, so, so that's the center, okay? One quick, one quick follow-up before you go on. And then on. we can get into the extremes on either side. Yeah, of course. I want to understand, though, how you would articulate the difference between you and I as consumers and you and I as taxpayers. So yes, of course, we might not buy every single good from every single corporation in the country, but I could see a world where we just say it all evens out. I go to Taco Bell, you go to Burger King. Um, I, once again, I'm subsidizing the worker at Burger King, you're subsidizing the worker at Taco Bell, but that seems fine. What's the difference between being a taxpayer and just a consumer? They seems to be pretty well correlated there. Well, you know, to begin with, if you're allowing wages to become a lower and lower share over time uh, of, of uh, work, uh, of the overall income of a worker, uh, then you have like a pon it's like a negative Ponzi scheme, basically. The wages get lower, the, the social wage, the subsidy gets higher until finally uh, nobody is paid everything and you're totally subsidized by the government. And everybody is working for the government on welfare uh, with a work requirement, okay? And in the South, I'm a native uh, Texan, we had a system called the convict lease system 100 years ago in the Southern states, where basically the uh, prisons leased out the labor on a temporary basis uh, to uh, private you know, consumers and private employers. So if, if the government, it, it basically the problem with the, the low wage, high uh, welfare system is you have two bosses, right? Just from the point of view of personal dignity and autonomy, you have two bosses. There's your boss who pays you the wage that is too little to live on. And then there's the government welfare bureaucracy, 
And you have to fill out all kinds of forms for the most part to prove that you're really needy. You have to humiliate yourself. You have to, there are, it's incredibly difficult if you know any poor people because there isn't a single welfare system. Each program has separate eligibility requirements, separate forms, and all of this. So it's a nightmare from the point of view of the poor workers. Uh, and it's also biased in terms of class because labor intensive goods and services, the very ones that are subsidized by the EITC and by these other forms of uh, wage subsidy uh, are used disproportionately by elite Americans, right? Uh, if you're working class, it's DIY, DIY, you do it yourself. You mow your own lawn, you wash your own car, right? You know, you may cut your own hair in some cases or your kid's hair. Uh, as your income goes up, you have servants. You have this retinue of people. You have personal shoppers. You have dog walkers, okay? So, so essentially, the people who are most likely to purchase the services of, uh, uh, in, of low-wage workers are themselves affluent professionals and rich people. So we're subsidizing butlers and maids and nannies and pool boys and or pool people, I should say, and so on. Uh, so th there's and the reason I, I stress worker power, not worker income, is because much of the right and the left thinks, well, power and dignity don't matter as long as you have money. Uh, Mickey Kaus, my old colleague from the New Republic back in the 1990s, he was very good on this. He, he spoke about money liberalism, okay? So if you have a terrible job, you don't control the scheduling from week to week. Uh, you don't know whether you're gonna work tomorrow or not. You know, you don't have any vacations. You don't have any health insurance. But if uh, the government makes sure you make the same amount of money as another worker who's represented by a union uh, and has channels of regressive grievances, in the workplace and has some voice and say in, in working conditions, that's a blind spot. It's a blind spot shared by the right and the left. So it, worker power is not just about the power of workers individually and collectively uh, to get more money, uh, but it's also uh, to be treated decently, to shape their schedules, right? You know, and to be consulted by their bosses instead of treating as interchangeable units of production. I guess a question, and we will get to the extremes, the more interesting extremes when it comes to this issue. I'd like to you to respond to what I feel as if the center left person would say, which would be, oh no, I, I, I'm thinking about let's say that worker situation, because I would support a government ban on variable scheduling. So like, that's like when you're in, um, you know, you're in like, uh, oftentimes it's like a retail job or like a fast food job where like your schedule isn't consistent. It's different hours. You can't construct a life around that. I've seen plenty of center left, like critiques of that system. I think they would just say, the answer to that is a government mandate, just in the same ways that we like, man or we have mandatory paid sick leave. I feel as if there's a whole gamut of things the government could do top down that wouldn't necessarily involve, let's say, changing this worker power dynamic. How would you respond to that? Oh yeah, that's that's essentially the contemporary progressive left is technocratic and elitist. Uh, their theory of politics is. You have the poor suffering masses uh, and they feel for them and you know, their hearts bleed for them. You have the evil elites and then you have the good elite. They're the good elite. And so it's a matter of the good elite taking power and doing good to the poor suffering masses who gratefully receive the benefits. So again, it's about sharing, it's in this technocratic, uh, neoliberal or technocratic progressive approach, you just have like the altruistic experts uh, who care about people and care about the country and they just get elected to Washington or executive agencies and they do the right thing. Uh, the workers of the world, to the point of phrase, uh, historically have not trusted upper class educated do-gooders. And this is true for the entire industrial period. Uh, they would rather have the power 
to negotiate deals directly with employers than to have Eleanor Roosevelt or Francis Perkins, who was uh, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, Secretary of, of Labor. Uh, I mentioned Francis Perkins because she's famous for saying, I would rather pass a law than organize a union. And that has always been the approach of patrician, upper class, progressive reformers. We know what's good for the lower reporters. There's no reason to consult with them. There's no reason to involve them in the process. We'll just, we'll just help them, you know, uh, by, by fiat, by executive order, or by law. Uh, let's look at the minimum wage, for example. Uh, throughout the 20th century, unions in Western Europe opposed minimum wage laws. They opposed them because they thought they could get better deals through ne direct negotiations. So the only minimum wages you had in countries like Britain and Germany were uh, for uh, small, part-time, uh, very decentralized occupations uh, where it was very difficult to unionize them. Peace work, you know, sewing by, by poor women, and so on, out of their homes. So for, those, for that minority of poor workers, uh, you had wage boards, which would have set a minimum wage for that industry only. But in steel and automobiles and, and all of these other uh, occupations, the unions wanted to set the wages through negotiation. Uh, and you didn't get a minimum wage in Britain and in Germany until the 1990s and the 2000s as a result of the decline of union power. So, so essentially, I guess what I'm, I'm telling you is the, the entire conversation that we've had, that we're having in the 2020s, is between the upper middle class left, the upper middle class right, the upper middle class right, about how to help those poor unfortunate people, right? Now, if we go back to 1950 or 1960, you have Lane Kirkland from the AFL-CIO, right? You have union leaders, you have Jimmy Alpha. And they're going to say, well, wait a second. I don't want to be part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, I know we'll get to the extremes, but I want to make sure I'm being fair to all sides here because um, I just did the center left version. The center right version would, and I'd like to he hear you um, dismantle, like argue against my sense of the center right comfortable story. Because I think the key thing that's coming from your articulation is that no matter what, ultimately these answers, quote unquote, um, are ones that find a center left or center right person very comfortable. They're not pushing against the assumptions. That's your point around the technocratic top down version. The center right version of this would be, well, Michael, the purpose of government economic policy, if there is any purpose at all, is to expand the pie with more economic growth. There'll be more, there, there will just be there'll be more money for um, employers. We should focus on inflation. Inflation, you know, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene would be very comfortable stating this. Um, in, in, not that she's center-right, but, you know, she's status quo economics from that perspective. Inflation's eating up workers' salaries. We need to focus there. Like, what, what would be your, your response to the center-right? Because they're not going to say tap, tap, top, tap. The, the, the center-right is going to nod uh, with the first half of your statement. They're going to say, you're right, Michael. They are top-down. They do want fiats and mandates, et cetera. What is the center-right response to your critique? Well, the center-right and the right, the theoretical response is the same. Policy is different. The center-right favors the socialization of the living costs of low-wage workers to some degree. They're, they're for the earning of tax credit. So, oh, yeah, quick thing, because like you do see this in debates. They would say, don't increase the minimum wage, increase the EITC if we need to do any increase. That'd be the yeah, which, which is a subsidy to employers. Of course, they would say that, right? They're talking their book. But the, and then the libertarians say, no, we're not going to do anything, right? We just pay people, you know, 25 cents an hour and then charity or something, or they'll die. So, so the libertarian case is not serious in terms of, of, of policy. Uh, so the actual Republican conservative uh, policy is the neoliberal policy. It's, you know, we, we let employers pay poverty wages, and then we tax the public to top up the difference. And they may, you know, they tend to prefer cash transfers to in-kind programs, but that's a distinction without a difference. Theoretically, the, uh, the center-right and the libertarian right use the same bogus theory of economics, uh, which is bogus in two ways. First, 
uh, they assume that most uh, industries in a modern economy are competitive by nature. The fact is, in a machine age economy, the most progressive and dynamic industries uh, tend to be highly concentrated. They're dominated, like manufacturing, by natural oligopolies and monopolies, which is not a bad thing because these uh, uh, highly capitalized big firms, uh, if they want to, they can spend all their money on vacations and for their CEOs or stock buybacks. But if they want to, they can recycle their, their profits, which they get because they have market bargaining power uh, uh, that they would not have under perfect competition. They can recycle these products in innovation, giving us a new, new uh, scientific and engineering breakthroughs. Uh, but so the econ 101 model in which uh, all firms ideally would be perfectly competitive and compete with each other to drive down prices does not exist in the real world, has never existed and never can, because in a perfectly competitive economy, there would be no profits, right? Uh, the price would reflect the costs with no room for profit on top of that. And so all firms would go bankrupt simultaneously. Not only would there be no uh, room for wages out of profits, there'd be no return on capital or, or uh, uh, wages for uh, employ, you know, CEOs and, and executives. So that's the first mistake, to ignore the fact that most uh, industries are characterized by imperfect competition in which firms have the ability, it's called pricing power. They can charge more uh, than their costs, which is, 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 sometimes it's called a rent. But as far as I can tell from talking to many economists, there's no difference between a rent and a profit. It just means you have profits. So the second question is, well, how are the profits distributed? And here there are two basic theories that have gone back hundreds of years. One is the theory of Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and other people who are classical liberals. They're always cited by the right. And Smith and Mill say, oh, as I point out in the book, well, it depends on the bargaining power <laughs> of the stakeholders, how the profits are distributed. So there are three stakeholders in your typical public and trade corporation, uh, groups of stakeholders. There are the investors, right? The shareholders, they get dividends. There are the executives, the managers, they get wages. We'll ignore stock options for a moment. Yeah. Uh, then there are the workers, the employees. So uh, there's nothing, according to the Adam Smith J.S. Mill theory, the, how the profits are distributed among these three groups depends on the bargaining power of the three groups. Uh, and the workers usually have the least bargaining power and the capitalist shareholders have the most, and, but the managers have more bargaining power than the workers. Uh, so against this, you see, and particularly in conservative magazines, which should know better, this. Uh, this truly academic and truly unreal theory of how wages are set, which is that it, it's called the marginal uh, revenue productivity theory. It goes back a hundred years. And it says that your pay is set by your marginal contribution to the productivity of the firm, which is an interesting theory and you can mathematically model it. Uh, it makes no sense in, in reality. Uh, how, how, how do you monitor this? Uh, is, you know, is this generally salary negotiations are annual, right? Uh, if you really believe this, this uh, right-wing uh, free market economic theory of how wages are set, then your productivity goes up and down during the day, right? I mean, when you need some coffee and you're getting slow and slacking off, you know, then your wage should go down. Then you drink some coffee and you become really energetic and productive and like your wage should go up. So it's a purely specious mathematical theory that was popularized a hundred years ago by, by neoclassical economists who hated trade unions and wanted to come up with some kind of theory of wage setting other than the bargaining theory, which everyone, including classical liberal economists like Adam Smith and, and uh, Mill and uh, Marshall, had accepted to that point. So one, one final point on this, the bargaining thing is very important because it's why the, the free market right gets utilities wrong as well. Uh, 
according to usually both the left and the right, the way we're miseducated, there are only two ways to set prices. One is a perfectly competitive market. The other is government fiat, it's government mandate, right? They ignore the fact that there's a third method of setting prices. That's negotiations. That's bargaining. So when you're bargaining with a vendor, you know, in a bazaar or a flea market or something, there is no absolute fixed price, right? The price of the item depends on how desperate the vendor is to unload it and, and how much you want it as, as a buyer. So any theory that says the market determines wages without any intervention of bargaining power is, is false as a matter of fact and false as a matter of theory. But that is what uh, I'm, I'm sure the reviews of my book from the free market conservatives and libertarians, you know, they'll, they'll say this. They'll say wages are set automatically by this mysterious auction process and any attempt to interfere with it uh, will lead to total disaster. So before we go on, I do want to speak to you, your point about how the um, further left and then further right parts of this debate response. We gave like the center left, center right. Like, how do you see, um, I don't even want to say like the DSA left, because that's kind of not really a valid concept, but how do like more progressive people to the right and how do you sort of to the left and then like more new right um, adjacent folks on the right respond to this worker power question? Well, there is kind of a convergence between some of the techno-libertarians and the socialists on a UBI, a universal basic income. Uh, and the theory is that uh, thanks to automation, thanks to productivity growth, uh, fewer and fewer people will be needed uh, to contribute to the productivity of the economy, right? The machines will make everything like in Star Trek, you have your little synthesizers. Uh, and at that point, uh, you, you no longer need people as workers, but you need them as consumers maybe, to have a mass market for the Star Trek synthesizer goods. Uh, so, so you just tax. There's usually an elitist eugenics Nietzschean element to this because the people who hold this theory generally hold that they are themselves the productive members of society. It's everyone else is a useless drone or a parasite, right? But I, the Silicon Valley person, or I, the lefty professor, I will always have a job, right? Uh, but there will be all the, all the proles will be unemployed, so you tax me, or sometimes you tax the machines, now that's done, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and uh, you, you will then redistribute that, just give people, and this goes back to Milton Friedman, actually, 1962, his book, Capitalism and Freedom, he was for a universal basic income uh, set at just the a poverty level. Uh, and Charles Murray revived this. Uh, and so there are two problems with it. The first is we are not suffering from uh, like a great massive productivity breakthrough. Productivity has been lower uh, for the last 30, 40 years than it was for the preceding Half century, uh, every few. And could you could you explain what productivity actually is in that context? And like what? Yeah, what productivity is it? means the ability to uh, make goods and services with fewer inputs. In this case, of human labor. I mean, but it's also can be energy, materials. But let's just say human labor here. So it's labor saving technology is the source of almost all productivity growth. Uh, and you know, here it is, twenty twenty three. If you watch uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, there's a huge gap, even HAL 9000, right, between the, the computers and chat GPI, okay. But we're still very far away from HAL 9000 in, in the movie. Uh, you know, having rapid productivity growth leading to mass transitional unemployment would be a good problem to have. I would love it if we had robot cars and robot truckers. And I, I would gladly deal with the transition for robot truckers, uh, you know, uh, for human truckers laid off by robots. Uh, that would be a good problem to have. It means we're getting more and more productive as an economy. 
Uh, instead, uh, you know, we, we have almost all of the jobs being created in the United States, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I list these in my book, Held a Play. They pay $25,000 or less. These are the top 10. None of them requires a college degree except registered nurse and store manager. Uh, it's things like manual labor, uh, you know, janitor, fast food cook. These are the jobs that are being created. So I just, I don't see this robot automation apocalypse, but let's assume that it occurred maybe a hundred years from now, okay? Uh, the basic contradiction is uh, if the robots are so cheap, then a tax on the robot, that everybody, that the prices are cheap, right? Everything, all the goods from the Star Trek synthesizer uh, are, are basically zero. Then the Star Trek synthesizer itself is cheap. The machine itself is not worth very much, right? It's like a microwave. Every home will have it. So, so saying that well, we will tax the robots to give everybody $12,000 a year, let's say poverty wage income, uh, or 15,000, whatever you pick. That's like saying we'll have a tax on microwaves, right? Or a tax on, on uh, iPhones to support 90% of the population. Uh, the, it just, it makes no sense economically. Well, uh, two responses. One, um, I have a model of the Starship Enterprise behind me, so I do have to say, you mean a Star Trek replicator? You you said it enough. I have to fact check you. Um, the the replicator is the device by the which there are the replicator. Um, hugely important high stakes fact check. But two, I guess just to understand something about the taxing the robots thing, wouldn't that really just operationally mean taxing the owners of the factory that build the robot. Oh, sorry. It, just taxing the owners of that factory. So yes, correct. Like taxing everyone's microwave wouldn't produce any value, but maybe taxing 1950s General Electric would have value in of itself within that, within that metaphor. So just explain the difference there. Because that's well, either how they would solve that issue. Well, in, 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 in this basic science fiction vision, uh, uh, factories become not like what we think of as factories, which employ a lot of people, but they become like mines mm. or they become like oil rigs. You know, they have few people, well-paid, but skeleton crew, and, you know, increasingly very automated. Uh, and, and in that case, it becomes uh, not an, an a productive industry so much as one that's just pure rent. The income is just pure profit. Okay. Right? And so in... The people who, so there are two solutions to that. One is uh, the owners simply own title to it. They, they have no work, I mean, the shareholders. They just own the title to the replicators. And then every time you replicate a burrito or a little, you know, uh, Supreme Court action figure or something like that, then, then you pay a royalty, you know, to the equivalent of Elon Musk of, the replicators, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to see the billionaire who owns all of the replicators not hiring armies of lawyers, human lawyers, maybe robot lawyers too, to evade taxation, which they do now, right? So how are you going to tax them? Uh, what's more, these super rich replicator owners not only will they own the replicators, they will own Congress and they will own the president. They will probably own the judiciary as well, okay? Uh, so you're assuming that there's this government uh, which is going to stand up to the replicator owners, have, have this confiscatory taxation, and then give money to 400 million Americans or 600 million or a billion or whatever. And, and the replicator owners are not going to move to Belize right, or incorporate in Jamaica or in Panama or the Bermudas. So politically, this just seems extremely naive. I mean, at least the Marxist revolution, you could actually physically seize the factories, seems more plausible to me than, than you know, imposing 90% taxes on the replicator owners. Uh, uh, so uh, the alternative is state socialism, uh, the government owns the replicators, right? Uh, but then in that case, 
do we really trust the government? And here I'm with the conservatives. Do we trust the government to allocate the proceeds from the, the, the universal basic income, right? I mean, we, we have a political class in the United States. It's not quite as bad as the nomenclatura in communist countries where they had their own personal, you know, separate economy from the proletarians, the communists supposedly represented. But all of our leaders, liberal and de de uh, Democrats and Republicans, almost all of them, they send their kids to private schools. They're millionaires. They travel on private jets. They've got a totally separate economy. So without having some kind of worker bargaining power, uh, uh, independent of elections, you know, then, then how do we prevent the elected politicians of all parties from saying, okay, the replicators generate 100% of national income every year. How much will go to us and then how much will go to the proles? Uh, maybe 80 to us, 20 to the proles, and then the, the liberals will say, no, no, 21% to the proles. And then the conservatives say, no, 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 that's too high, 19%, right? Uh, I guess what I'm, I'm, all of the answers I've noticed to my questions involve power. Mm -hmm. I use the term worker power. It's not worker income, it's worker power. And that's where we started. That's the key. Your, your, your key point was that the central flaw of that 90s approach is treating this solely as a analytical question of like how much income is showing up in the bank account every month then. Yeah, and, and it's technocratic. Uh, and, and whether it's promoted by the center right or the center left, it has forgotten the wisdom of the American constitutional tradition and of all real constitutional traditions, which is that power cannot be trusted. There must be checks and balances. And the checks and balances cannot be purely formal alone. They have to involve social checks and balances. You have to have powerful social groups that represent working class people outside of the political system, outside of the uh, like uh, unions and like uh, churches. Those are the two major mass membership organizations in modern societies. It's religious organizations and it's labor unions. Uh, and they are able to represent their members directly uh, in public life in a way that, you know, working class people casting a vote every four years, if they vote at all, simply does not completely represent them. Uh, you, you want a combination of political democracy that's competitive and, and formal checks and balances between executive, and judiciary, and legislative. But you also want to have powerful extra governmental institutions that are accountable to working class people. The leaders don't have to be working class, but they have to be removable by their followers. Uh, and, uh, and those basically are organized labor in some form, not necessarily the form that exists today in the US. Uh, religious institutions, conceivably you could have grassroots civic institutions, but whatever they are, they have to be collective and they have to be uh, disciplined and they have to be hierarchical. And this goes against the entire trend since the 60s on left, right and center of its, you know, the me generation and its individualism and all of that. The only thing that working people have to bargain with, with the uh, professional and capitalist elites is their numbers. And those numbers are only powerful if they are organized, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, this is why we will need a cultural revolution, I think, uh, uh, to increase working power. People have to be able to join chapters of national organizations and they need to uh, take part and participate. It can't just be a matter of liking something on Twitter. That's not, that's not real politics. I think the, a couple, couple of things in our last 20 minutes or so. So one, you've really taken us to what you define as the, the, the American crisis right now, um, which you believe this issue of too many bad jobs um, at a benefits um, and salary level 
um, fueled by lack of working or bargaining power stem from. So we've got the falling for uh, falling fertility, um, a plague of loneliness and a lack of friendship, conflicts over racial and gender gender identity, and then finally um, a politics of culture wars on the right and and uh, moral panics on the left. To, to y- your central argument is that all of those big trends are just downstream from this lack of power, which takes us to where you just left us at, which is. How does if, if we're gonna if we're gonna pot, could you actually explain how those trends actually come from the lack of worker bargaining power? It's, it, it's obvious for some, not obvious to others. Oh, oh yeah, and it's not a monocausal explanation, but my argument is that the lack of w- worker bargaining power causes bad jobs. There's just too many bad jobs that pay poverty wages and that force you to rely on welfare. And it's the bad jobs directly that cause these problems. It's not the worker power itself, but it's the bad jobs. And in order to escape bad jobs, uh, you have this frenzied competition for good jobs. Uh, And it takes on different forms. One form is to protect yourself from being a low wage worker, you know, who has to fill out one form for Medicaid and one form for food stamps and another form for uh, housing vouchers. This is the nightmare at the back of, you know, uh, not of the elite in this country, their cushion. But if you're dubiously middle class, you can see yourself sinking in to this means tested, welfare dependent proletariat. And it's, it's both horrible in itself, and it's also a matter of shame and humiliation. So to escape this, uh, in the old days, you had unions that could raise the wages. Uh, and that way, the same job would just pay more and could support a lower middle class lifestyle. But those have been destroyed. So they're basically, one of the responses is credentialism. Okay, and credentialism takes two forms. One is college diplomas. Lots of people go to college. In fact, almost everyone goes to college to get a good job. That's why their parents say, you have to get a good job today. You have to have a BA. Uh, And uh, it's not that you learn any specific skills. It's used, as I argue in the book, relying on Federal Reserve data, uh, a huge proportion of jobs held by young Americans with BAs do not require a college education. There are a lot of Starbucks baristas with BAs who could do the same work with a high school diploma. But uh, employers increasingly have been using BAs as a screening device. Right, and then it's just lazy on the part of employers, and also because for legal reasons they can't give aptitude tests, uh, which which were racially disparate in their impact. So so they're basically just saying, okay, we'll only look at people with BAs, even if high school workers can do that job. So too many people are crowding into universities. And, and of a course quick pause there because I think it's important right. to hit this point. What the higher education system would say, and what the employers would say, and you're arguing explicitly against is no, like college is about skills. College is about increasing one's productivity. So if we have this problem of too many bad jobs in America right now, well, that's because we don't have an educated worker force. We don't have, there's a skills gap. So we send people to college to help. That's the story that you're telling, that, that they are telling. And your point is, if you actually delve into the data, it's not as if people are coming out of those four years of college like hyper skilled. It's it's actually just that it's being used as that credentialing process. There's a difference between a credentialing process and a skills generating process. Well, it, it helps both the employers because they can say, "Well, you know, we'd really like to pay more. You know, we're we're sorry that we give all of the profits to our shareholders and to ourselves, the managers. We'd love to pay our workers more, but they're just not educated enough. Maybe." If they had an MA, we would pay them a little bit more. And of course, the universities are, are you know, voracious for revenue, right? So, so they're empire builders. The more students, the better. Uh, but look, all you have to do to know that this whole story is false, even though it's the establishment story, is to look at those Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, uh, analyses of jobs. Uh, the BLS, every uh, 10 years or so, updates its list of jobs projections for the next 10 years. Uh, And so, as I said earlier, only two of the top 10 uh, in their most recent version require
fire BA, nurses and, and store managers. Uh, all of the rest would require high school or less. These are the top 10 jobs being created in absolute numbers. They pay terribly, uh, like in the 20s, uh, 20,000s. Uh, and, but you can go to the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's like jobs of, of tomorrow or jobs of the future. I forget the title of it. Uh, and it just, it shows you, you know, there's no lack of skills. And what's more, it makes no sense logically. See, that's why I wrote this book, uh, Marshall, because these things that people say that, well, Americans need more education. They want to be paid more. They want to be in China. Uh, Janitors are not paid twenty-five thousand a year because they didn't go to college. Okay, if if a janitor goes and gets a PhD, you can be paid the same thing, right? It has nothing to do with credentials. It has to do with bargaining power uh, of of the workers. And professionals have done well. Uh, and you and I are members of this college-educated professional class, uh, but. In my day, certainly uh, long ago, very few people went to college. It's like top 10, 15 percent. Uh, now it's approaching uh, 40 percent in the U.S. It's approaching 50 percent in Europe, and that devalues it. I mean, if everybody gets a BA, uh, then it's like a high school diploma. It's just like four more years of high school. It doesn't give you great uh, jobs. Uh, you know, it, it, you then the MA becomes the new BA. So then everybody has to have an MBA and this, and I'm getting to, to your question, this leads to the collapse of family formation. Uh, because if you have 30, 40% of the population spending their 20s, uh, deferring married, getting married and having kids, and most people, there's growing the illegitimacy rate, but most people, uh, uh, there's a high correlation between having kids and being married. Uh, uh, if you're deferring this to your 30s and you do get married in your 30s, then you're not going to have that many kids, biology, you know, uh, uh, being what it is. Uh, and meanwhile, the working class, we see marriage rates collapsing and more children out of wedlock. Uh, and that is a result of this credentialism, too, because they've just given up, right? They've given up on the upper middle class dream of being in college, getting your master's bachelor's, your master's, your professional degree, you know, making partner, getting married at 40, and then, you know, having, I guess, fertility treatments, in the case of women, to have your first kid at 50, right? Working class, I'm ne- I can't afford that. I can't go to college. Uh, uh, but at the same time, their vision of marriage, and there's some very good scholars at Climate Stone and, and others are, are very good on this. They want to have a big wedding. They want to have a, a house in the suburbs. And since they can't have that, they're not going to get married. They have kids out of one. And maybe they hope in the future, maybe I'll get lucky. Uh, so, so there's a chain reaction. The, the desperate desire to escape of being a low-wage worker on Medicaid and food stamps leads to too many people going to college. It leads to another form of credentialism, which is occupational licensing, which is creating cartels uh, to keep people out, to raise up wages. Uh, And uh, and then it has this domino effect on marriage rates, on family formation. And and finally, there's there's identity politics and partisan polarization. I attribute in part to this fear of escaping low-wage jobs, because there aren't that many good jobs, as you know, in the professoriate uh, among journalists. One of the reasons you have wokeness, and this is not an original argument for me, is that it gives you a competitive advantage, right? Uh, you know, over, over your rivals, right? If, if you can say, I represent this group that is not otherwise represented, uh, then that gives you an advantage in this very small, highly competitive uh, uh, group of jobs. And uh, the partisan polarization uh, is, is, I attribute, and this may sound strange, but I attribute it partly on, to the collapse of unions on the left and of churches on the right. Unions on the left, churches on right. Yeah, that's right. 
Yeah, unions on the left, churches on the right. Because uh, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, the unions were the base of the Democratic Party. Uh, and uh, churches were very important for, for the right, long before the religious right, you know, and, and, and so on. Uh, although they tend to be Democratic. Uh, but the Democrats had many conservatives at the time. So left and right were somewhat different. Than Ideology wasn't correlated with party in the same way. Yeah. But if you look at studies of polarization, what the kind of working class people, uh, African-American, Latino, Asian, not Hispanic, white. Uh, I mean, I look at the polls. I've, I've looked at them for 30 years. It's always the same. It's good jobs, safe neighborhoods, you know, low crime. Uh, uh, you know, health insurance, basic, you know, bread and butter stuff is what working class voters of both parties are really interested in. Uh, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the activists, the affluent college educated, middle, uh, upper middle class, <clears throat> people, small business owners, and so on, both Democrats and Republicans, it's climate change, abortion rights, you know, pro and con, uh, you know, Wokeness to some degree, that's more of a cause, I think, both pro and con among uh, the elite than it is among uh, working class people. I'm not saying it's not important. Uh, I'm, I'm a critic of it. Uh, but, you know, it is kind of ironic to see these supposed working class conservatives going on and on and on about, you know, pronouns and, and you know, college classes when the biggest threat to their working class Republican voters is they don't they couldn't come up with the $400 or so in an emergency, right? They're likely to be bankrupted by a medical bill. That's what's, if you're a working class conservative, you can do both. You can be anti-woke and <laughs> see something about medical bankruptcy. But with our primary system since the 70s, working class people of all races are less likely to vote in primary and affluent and college educated people. Uh, and the, the media in particular, the centrist media, likes to think educated people are moderates and the ignorant rabble are extreme. It's actually the other way around. Uh, the working class tends to be more moderate on many issues and realistic than uh, highly educated people who become entranced with ideologies, right? Because they're not focused on- So this is some Maslow's hierarchy of needs dynamic yeah, exactly, going on. Exactly. You can afford to become a zealot if you're economically secure, right? Uh, it takes a certain amount of money to be a, you know, to, to have climate change in the year 2100 being the chief thing you cast your vote on, right? Or, you know, the war in Ukraine, if you're a, Never Trump Republican or something. Like that. Uh, so, so we've seen. So I'm not saying we would have all of these problems in one form or another if we had higher wages. Uh, but I think the effects would be ameliorated. They wouldn't be cured. But imagine if you, out of high school, a high school diploma only, doesn't require new jobs. It's existing jobs. The jobs the the BLS says are being created. Uh, the janitors, instead of making twenty-five thousand, make thirty-five or forty thousand. Okay, uh, then they don't have to spend their twenties in college, hoping to make more money. You know, they can get married, have kids in their early twenties. You know, buy a little starter house. Uh, you know, which it tends the Republicans should be in favor of that because home ownership and children tends to have a conservatizing effect on people, right? Uh, so. Uh, but so the question then becomes the one that we discussed earlier. Okay, so we raise the janitor's salary from twenty five thousand to thirty or forty a year. Uh, who does that? Uh, is it an enlightened elite in Washington, whether it's bipartisan or one party just takes over and rams it through, uh, or do you give workers the collective power through some system? of collective bargaining, not necessarily the one we have. I think the one we inherited from the 1930s is broken. It's not coming back, as I argue. But some system of collective bargaining. So we allow workers in different occupations 
I'm using the janitor example because my uh, grandfather was a janitor. Uh, so you, you give the janitors the ability through organized labor uh, or through representation in some form. It can be on a wage board where labor is represented, but they negotiate directly with the employers. Uh, and you don't have to have a bill going through Congress to do this. Now, the reason I think if if you're serious about the working class- Wait, pause. Why don't you, this is, this is what I was about to ask you, so I'll just move it up. It does feel like you need a bill moving through Congress because let me put it, my, my theory of politics is always if, if, if something was desirable and straightforward, it would have happened already. I think we could pull- all of the janitors of America and say, hey, if they were, we, we have a way for you to take that up from 25 to 30 to 35, it would just happen. The fact that it's not happening suggests to me there is some room for government interference, mandate, et cetera. Do, do you kind of get what I'm saying? I don't understand. It feels like there's we're, we're missing a piece there. Yeah, well, no, but, but here's, here's where I am with, with the conservatives. Uh, the U.S. has 330 million people. We're the third most populous nation in the world. We're a continental country. There are enormous variations in living standards uh, and the cost of living, not only between states, but within states, between big cities, small towns, rural areas. Uh, and as I point out in Hell to Pay, what would be the most generous uh, living wage, family wage for that matter, you know, in, in, uh, uh, in, in the Great Plains would be barely a poverty wage in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So this is the, and we've actually had two systems of raising wages in American history, and we're heir to both of them. There was the 1935 National Labor Relations Act, which created the modern system of collective bargaining that is almost completely fallen apart now. Uh, uh, but I'm just saying that was, the idea was you give the workers the tools, and then they use their power to extort higher wages and, and I use the word extort, yes, to blackmail them and to give you higher wages and better benefits and decent hours. Or the alternate method is the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, another legacy of the New Deal, which is where the minimum wage comes from. And it's where the 40 hour week comes from. Uh, you know, and it's just, it's the same 40 hour week for all industries, uh, with some exceptions, uh, the same minimum wage. So my, Prejudice is in favor of giving the workers the bargaining power they need and let them do the job instead of uh, having a single one size fits all policy, which but would who, not cut them out who, of participation. But yeah. who gives the workers those power, the, that power? Oh, that has to be done. That has to be done by congressional. Yeah, and that, that's the yeah. Okay, so, 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 it's, it's, I, I, yeah, okay, great. Because I wanted to understand. So, because I was just asking, like, where is the federal role in this? Because also at a state no, level, the, the, the there are plenty of red states that would not go around, go around this on a couple yeah. of different levels. So, you, you, your your opinion of the federal role here is to empower the workers to but utilize their work to, power, not to dictate the results. Okay, that's the okay. Thank you. That's helpful. You um, see, I, I, I think this is this is why some members of the business elite. Now, given the basically, if they can have complete autocracy, they will. But if they have a choice between a one size fits all system of hour and wage mandates imposed by Congress, or they have a choice between with other system where they are compelled to negotiate with, not necessarily in their own workplaces, it can be at the sectoral level of an entire industry, then, you know. They, it depends on, on the business, but they might prefer to take their chances, you know, negotiating, particularly in the private sector, because the difference between the private sector and the public sector is in the nonprofit sector. The private sector, workers, if they are rational, want their companies to succeed. They want their firms to succeed. They want their industries to succeed, right? Uh, and so if their leaders are good, they're not going to make demands that will destroy, you know, the firms that employ them. Uh, and uh, so I think you can make a case to business leaders, at least in some industries, that wouldn't you rather negotiate with representatives of employees in this whole industry uh, 
then, you know, to think you're a lobbyist can simply kill any reform in Congress, because when the reform comes, it may take the form of a congressional mandate or an executive order that you really won't like. So for the last question here, um, at the end of the forward, you offer a kind of just your, your your articulation of how all of this should fit together. I think the most useful bit I took from New Class War is just this idea of bargaining. You have different classes, you have different um, manifestations of, let's say, energy, you know, government, you have industry, you have the workers. You think that moving forward, as we're moving away from this peak of 1990s neoliberal um, slash libertarian globalization, we are going to need a, an, a, a, a new tripartite um, combination of government, industry, and then labor partnership to address both these challenges we're discussing here on this show, but also broader ones. That includes everything from a, a broken style of politics to great power competition, technological innovation, industrial policy, et cetera. Can you just close with the vision for how those three um, groupings could partner together and what that looks like? Because it's less about the specific outcome and more about how could these interlocking parts produce a um, a sum greater than the whole of its parts? Well, I'm, I'm glad you raised great power competition because that has returned now. In my view, we are in Cold War II with uh, China and, and with a Sino-Russian bloc, at least for the moment. And this is an all-out Cold War. I mean, you know, this is like Cold War. What I now think of as Cold War I. Uh, it won't necessarily escalate to direct hostilities, but it means this vision of a borderless global market uh, and the U.S. policing the world. This is dead. This is, it's over, right? We're now in a militarily bipolar world, in a, in a conflict with uh, uh, authoritarian China uh, that will last for decades or maybe generations. Uh, and in that kind of great power conflict, you have to have unity at home. Uh, this is one reason, by the way, that the business community did not wage all-out war against labor uh, during World War II and the Cold War, uh, because if, if you have a class war ripping your society to pieces, this only benefits your adversaries, right? Uh, so the idea of tripartism, the idea that the economy is a shared project of innovation and dynamism and growth, and it is shared among business, government, and labor, organized labor in some form. Uh, you know, this, this is an old idea. It goes back, uh, the, the phrase, the harmony of interests was associated with the 19th century American economist, Henry Carey, who was one of the big influences on Abraham Lincoln. And if, if you look at Republican presidents, Calvin Coolidge signed the Railway Labor Act and addressed union leaders and said, we recognize the necessity of organized labor in a modern society. Herbert Hoover said similar things, Richard Nixon, Eisenhower. Uh, the pure anti-labor stance of the uh, Republican party is post uh, it, it's, it's If you look at the platforms, Republican party platforms from the 20s to the 90s say we recognize the importance of organized labor, et cetera, et cetera. That gets cut out under the bushes, under this, this libertarian hijacking of the Republican Party from the 1990s up until Donald Trump in 2016. Uh, so so this, is, this is not just some kind of liberal thing. If anything, uh, it should be more attractive to conservatives, what are called national conservatives now, or post-liberals, because unlike the left, it does not assume that this is a way station to a borderless world or the global proletariat or a, a classless society, it assumes there are going to be quasi hereditary classes. You can't get rid of that without getting rid of families. There's going to be a working class. There's going to be capitalists. There's going to be executive people who come from executive families. What you need is a class compromise so that class conflict uh, doesn't rip the country apart. Uh, particularly when you're engaged in uh, long-term, persistent, low-level rivalries with uh, very powerful adversaries. I think that is an excellent 
place to end. Michael, this has been uh, such an amazing episode. Um, I thought about things a few different ways given this conversation. Uh, I'm sure I will have you on again at some point soon. Thank you so much for joining me on The Realignment. And um, the book is out, um, I believe, today. Um, we're releasing this in uh, May, obviously. So hope people will check it out. Thank you for having me.